Здравствуйте, товарищи! Welcome to a new video. In this video, I'm with Tom Christie, and we're going to be discussing the basic footwear of the Red Army during the Second World War. I'll leave it to you then, Tom. That's right, Jeff. What we're hoping to achieve with this two-part series on the footwear used by the Red Army throughout the Second World War is to educate those who may be new to reenacting the Red Army, as well as those who may have been doing it for some time, but need some extra guidance. We will cover in this video all of the basic types of footwear used by the Red Army, as well as the odd variations you may find on different fronts, as well as covering lend lease models. The first model I want to speak about today, Gem, is the basic Red Army logo. Now this was standard in the Red Army throughout Second World War. Say you're starting on a 60 to 40 ratio of low to high boots, at the end of the war you're probably on 70 to 30, so more high boots than low boots. Uh, there's no reason or rhyme for that, it seems to have been just a preferred way of manufacturing was to move over to the high boot. So anyway, focusing on the low boot, we'll see as far as boots go, it's a very basic design. Most other countries have this design. It's a boot, right? Um, but what differs it from other countries? Now, you'll know British uh, ammo boots, for example, they have quite a bulbous toe. Uh, German boots, you'll see a lot of hobnails on the bottom. Uh, American boots, you were even seeing some, some rubber soles. Now, the Red Army, in kind of opening stages of the war, or at least definitely pre war, it was very much a leather sole affair here. And now, what, what I have here is one of the most basic models you can have where it's a leather sole with a leather half sole. So the half sole is essentially this, this folded onto it so the other way around. And cut down to shape and size in order to properly fit the boot. Anyone who knows how to make boots and shoes probably know what's going on there. Exactly, it's just to reduce wear because if you have only one layer of sole, it's gonna wear through much quicker. Whereas if you have the half sole, you can wear through the half sole as you can see that's been done already on these boots and then replace the half sole, elongating the life of these boots. Uh, and what you'll see in photos, you'll see a wide variation of different sole and heel types being used. So from this basic leather half sole, leather heel, you will also see some with heel plates, very similar to British ammo boots. You will see some with half heel plates, very similar to what we have here. So these would be screwed on to the heel and also perhaps to the toe. Very similar just to elongate the life of these boots. Um, pretty much beginning from the start of the war and definitely a lot more prevalent from 1942 onwards, you'll see a lot of rubber soles coming in. The rubber soles will be the same boot but with a rubber composite sole. Uh, we have an example of that, of how these soles look on one of our high boots. These are called dotted soles. You'll probably see that referred to in a lot of Facebook groups or forums. It's just, uh, it's almost mimicking the hobnail design with rubber dots mm -hmm. on the boot. There is no half sole here. It's one composite single sole with a rubber heel. Sure. So you'll see that on low boots as well as you'll you see leather sole. Dead. Neither are wrong, uh, they're both absolutely right. And the problem with low boots in reenactment is, is it can be quite hard to find suppliers of these. Um, high boots were used by the Soviet army after the Second World War, pretty much up until the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So finding postal models can be quite easy, but low boots, you're pretty much going to have to find reproductions. Yes. Uh, the only decent reproduction out there at the moment is uh, through, through Roman Panos store called uh, Sodaska Lavka. Uh, Soldier store. Soldier store on Facebook, that's right. You can go through him, he has a good cobbler who can make absolutely correct boots with, with no issues. Now these boots, of course, like in any other army second world war, were not just worn as boots, they were worn also with putties. Now, the key difference between Red Army putties and putties of other nations throughout the war is the material they're made from. British putties made from wool. Did the Germans have putties? Uh, the Germans actually did have putties for their mountain troops and early on in the war, uh, but they were very rarely used, but they were made out of wool as well, yeah. as like many yeah. other countries. This was technology used from what, what starting the Boer War era, you see putties coming in? It, it, it was around those areas, actually yeah. more earlier periods around the Indian mutiny you start to see because the word putty is a Hindu word which literally means uh, wrapping bandage thing kind of like similar that's and, my and, and that's, that's exactly what they are it's just a long strip of cloth now the difference with the red army ones to our most of our arms is that they are cotton 
So they'd be a lot less stretchy than the wool ones, mm -hmm. but they're a lot harder wearing. Now, unfortunately, uh, this technology is quite hard to come by. And what I mean by it is the technology to produce these. Because what you need to do is produce meters and meters and meters of this stuff, because it has to go around your leg. Uh, in terms of reenactor suppliers, not many have managed to achieve this. The only store that I know of that can supply the cotton putties is, again, Roman Panov's Sadaska so Lavka. Uh, I hope he gives us commission for this, because clearly we're going to send lots of um, orders his way. But the colour of these ones is black. Uh, that's more common in the early stages of the war. Uh, what, you have to, well, what we believe is the reason for this is that when soldiers were standing in parade, if you had a mixture, yeah, you take one of those up. If you had a mixture of soldiers wearing the high boots and the low boots, then when the putties are done up to your just below your knee in a formation, it will look very similar. It gives uniformity for you know army say. Exactly. The later on in the war, you start to see variations come out. You see going from black to grey to khaki to green. Um, you can find these colour variations from your typical suppliers like Schuster's or Voin's Becks or Voin and yeah, you can get them quite easy with that. The next model we want to move on to, because in this first part video we're only going to cover the basic models, those which are not too Gucci, not too out there, mm -hmm. is the basic high boot. Oh, sorry, I should get there. That's all right. So, we have two models here with us. And what I'll do, so I'll just put one of these down and take that one there off. So, on the left here, we have a soldier's leather high boot, and on the right, we have an officer's leather high boot. Now, they're both filled boots. We won't, uh, I'll go into parade boots a little bit later on, but as you can see, it can be quite hard to distinguish between the two. Um, one of the key differences, what you're looking at, if you're buying these online, for example, if you're looking on eBay for Soviet jack boots, for example, a uh, good identifier, if you hold that one to the side there, is the top of the boot. You'll see on the soldier's model, it's very much a straight shaft at the top, but on the officer's model, it's a curved shaft. Now that can be quite hard to tell in photos sometimes, sometimes it can be really clear, um, but that's one of the ways you, you can have a look and determine whether or not you're looking at soldier's boots or officer's boots. And the second most concrete method, really, is the rear of the boot. You'll see that soldiers' boots have a strip of reinforcing leather, whereas officers' boots do not. They simply uh, fold in together and are sewn. Uh, it's likely because soldiers' boots are going to be used in, in a more strenuous manner, and they need to be able to um, keep up with what a soldier's doing. Um, and the third, the third way of, of telling is on an officer's boot, the top section of the boot is sewn over the lower section, whereas on the soldier's boot, the lower section is sewn over the top part. Uh, this is kind of a, a throwback to, de to days of cavalry. Um, I spoke to a friend of mine, Alex Wood, who does English Civil War, and he said in that period it was done because uh, cavalrymen, the water would be coming down the boots uh, from the horse, whereas with soldiers on the ground it was coming up. How true that is, I don't know, but it's a very identifying feature between officers and soldiers' boots. This is the most basic model used by the Red Army throughout the Second World War. It's the full leather boot, or sapog. Um, the top section is all pebbled leather. The lower section is pebbled leather with a rubber dotty sole. Now, the sole, it's not... The rubber dotty sole is not the only correct sole you can have with this. You can have full leather soles. You can have those with hobnails on them as well. You're going to have them with, with leather soles and leather heel plates with uh, German style like yeah. horseshoes on the bottom of them. Um, there's so many variations, but the, the key point you want to get right is the construction of the boot that way. Um, they're quite wide in terms of the bottom of, of the boot. Uh, the reason for that is they're designed to be worn with foot wraps with Pojanki. Um, so if you do wear them as a reenactor, we advise definitely several pairs of shot socks if you're not using Pajanki. Um, do you have anything else to add? Well, to uh, one thing that we need to be talking about obviously for with Sapogi is uh, there are also, as uh, we needed to add, were uh, versions that are made using quote-unquote faux leather or uh, canvas uh, impregnated with rubber which are 
known as Kirza in the common uh, tongue, shall we say, but properly as someone who actually speaks Russian, you would be able to say it in a better way. That's exactly right. Kirza is, was a very um, innovative material at the time. In fact, we have an excellent example of Kirza next to us here. This is a 1939 dated officer's map case. And Kurza was a way of essentially replacing leather where, wherever possible. As we know, leather can be quite expensive. The nation may be need, needing to use it for other items rather than this. Where do you can save materials? One very interesting point is in the world of fashion that Gucci pioneered the use of impregnated leather. Uh, as during the Second World War, they found it very hard to get hold of leather in Italy. So it's even a little bit Gucci. The Kurza boots, for example, look very similar to this. In fact, they look almost identical. Almost. But what you'll find is that the top part of the boot, this entire shaft here, is canvas that's been impregnated with almost like a rubbery compound. Yes. It's waterproof, it's pretty damn good. Uh, the only issue you'll find with Kurza products is if they start to wear, there's no way you can really heal them. They're not a, it's not living. Mm -hmm. uh, well, leather is living, but you know what I mean. You, you can't polish them to, to you repair can't, You can't give moisture in it, you can't, you know, deal with the cracks by, you know, sealing them up with wax or whatnot. You, you can't really do that with canvas or... Rock. Exactly. So with, with these boots, the full leather boots, we know they were in use throughout the entire war. So this is the safest option to go with. It's also most likely going to last you the longest. Now, Kerza, we're still relatively unsure of the exact date when that came in. We have some conflicting documentation, but we do know the material definitely existed before the war. How do we know? Well, this is a 1939 dated nap case, and it's made from Kerza. So it was definitely around sometime in the late 1930s, but we don't know exactly when they started to make boots from it. Uh, typically, what you should stick with as a reenactor, as I would say, for any reenactments of 1941, try to stick with full leather, uh, high boots or low boots, and really only maybe mid to late 1942 should, should you be coming into Kurza boots. Um, we've tried to have a look at dig sites where they've dug up remains of Red Army soldiers and we can't find any evidence of Kurza really before battle of Stalingrad. So I'll, I'll go with, with those guidelines for that. Uh, with the officer boots, they're very similar. Very, very similar to, to the soldiers' ones. Again, uh, it's just a nice thick leather shaft. This model, actually, that I use uh, currently are incorrect. They have, um, th these are post war Soviet produced. They're quite easy to find on eBay. But you can see they have just a, a plain um, rubber sole. Now, as a reenactor, it's kind of okay to go with that as long as you make sure any photos you have been taken of you are not with your, with your sole shown. Um, it should be the goal of every reenactor to try to try their best to find the correct soles, but mm -hmm. as we know, some people may have large feet, a size 45, 44, or 44 is not that large, but you, you, and they'll, they'll struggle to find leather soles or dotty soles. Yeah. Uh, Voices has produced, I think, uh, some reproductions of this, but again, it, it can be quite hard to find. This obviously also applies with the um, other ranks sapogi, the private and NCO sapogi way. You shouldn't be trying to, you know, you want to hide the tractor soles if you have them. You should try to get the proper dotted soles and try to get them as soon as possible. I'm still looking for one personally, but it will be done eventually in the future. Yeah, as Jen was saying there, so the tractor sole boots, they are the standard Soviet army boots after the Second World War. Uh, the reason they're called tractor sole is just because the tread on the sole looks somewhat similar to uh, the tread on tractor's tires. Um, so that's the incorrect kind of um, rubber sole mm -hmm. you're going to get. You can also sometimes get ones like that where it's kind of flat rubber composite. But essentially, if you're getting a rubber sole and you want it to be absolutely correct, it needs to be the, a dotted sole. Dotted up, but actually, there is one, one di difference to that, but you will never ever find a reproduction of this. Uh, these are the strangely produced um, Leningrad, Leningrad models. Leningrad models. I, I cannot remember off the top of my head the name of the factory, but you'll see it in the photo that's coming up. Um, they are only seen really on the Leningrad front. I myself have seen them a lot around Nizhny Petrochok, which was an area of extremely heavy fighting just outside Leningrad during the blockade. Um, and what's very telling, what's very telling about these soldiers that I saw dug up is that they were they were not worn at all. They were mm -hmm. still almost new. So these soldiers to put them on in Leningrad, walked out to the front, 
had, had died so quickly because the rate of attrition was so high and their souls were almost unworn. But yeah, th th those are really the only two types of, of correct rubber-soled boots. If it, other than that, if it's not rubber-soled, you want to be going leather-soled. Well, I hope we have been able to cover everything regarding the basic footwear of the, the Red Army. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed this and I really want to say thank you for Tom helping me out in this video. And uh, please do write down some comments, ask questions, whatever you want to do, please do. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and I hope to see you guys on the next video. Thank you Jen for having me and I'm sure in part two we will cover all the strange and wondrous variations that you find through Lindley's and Erzatz models throughout the Second World War. See you guys then.